Hi, I'm your host, Dave Kemp, and this is Future Ear Radio. Each episode, we're breaking down one new thing, one cool new finding that's happening in the world of hearables, the world of voice technology. How are these worlds starting to intersect? How are these worlds starting to collide? What cool things are going to come from this intersection of technology? Without further ado, let's get on with the show. All right, so we are here. We've made it to the first milestone of the podcast, episode 50. Thank you to everybody who has uh, joined me along the way in Future Ear Radio. And uh, to celebrate episode 50, I thought, you know, I want to bring on a great guest. I want to bring on somebody special. So who better than Mr. Brett Kinsella? Brett, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Very honored that you introduced me that way. I remember <laughs> seeing some of your early uh, interviews with like Dave Cannington and other folks. And it's really been useful for me. I love dipping in. I don't listen to every episode, but I definitely like, oh, yeah, that's someone I want to hear what they have to say. And and get caught up because you are deeper in this space than you know almost anybody else out there. I mean, there's clearly a couple other people. Like I think you, you talked to Nick and some other folks, but uh, you're you're really deep in this, and I really uh, value your perspective. Well, thanks, Brett. Well, uh, you know, for the folks listening, um, you know, I'm going to give a, Brett a chance to formally introduce himself. But uh, you know, Brett um, has been a you know a really good. Uh, sort of North Star in terms of content creation and, and setting the tone of, you know, the consistency I think that you got to have. Um, I'm at episode 50. He's done, I think, like over 175. So uh, he is the master when it comes to um, the consistent podcast creation and, and just really building a narrative that way. So Brett, before we get started, just go ahead and introduce uh, to the audience, you know, who you are, a little bit of background on, around VoiceBot and, um, you know, what you do with it. Okay, sure. Uh, I guess the, the quick shout out is Brett Kinsella. You can find me on the Twitter at Brett Kinsella. Uh, so that's an easy way to connect with me if you're in the community or just have questions and want to you know, check out some of the conversations people are having in the industry, also on LinkedIn. So if you're in the industry, I'll connect with you on LinkedIn. There's a lot of knuckleheads that I don't connect with on LinkedIn, <laughs> but but anybody in the industry I try to connect with. So, uh, but probably more meaningfully for most folks, they're going to be familiar with voicebot.ai where we run you know, 60 to 70 articles a month uh, just on voice and AI technologies. Um, we also have a uh, voice bot podcast, which you talked about. So I've got, I think over 200 hours of interviews on there now. So yeah, like 175, but a lot of those are an hour and a half plus. I think you've, you've been on and uh, we were definitely well over an hour uh, when you and Andy were on with me to talk yeah. about hearables. Uh, so, so VoiceBot podcast really been great, uh, really fun. We've done that every week for over three years now. Uh, just keep putting it out uh, because it's just, you know, it's just a great way to to learn. I mean, I think for me and and to, to pass that learning along to the the interviewers because what I do is I just I ask questions and I let people mm -hmm. talk and you know I think it's been really useful uh, for for so many folks. We and then we have VoiceBot uh, research. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a newer enterprise, which we've been putting out research for a couple of years now, since early 2018. We did some in 2017, but really formalized it in 2018. And uh, we launched a formal research service so we could do more. Uh, and we did that earlier this year. So those are these long, in-depth uh, profiles and reports, consumer adoption, technology analysis, market analysis. So that's been good. And then the last thing is, which I think we might talk about a little bit, is Voice Insider. Mm -hmm which is sort of fun. Uh, that's something that I, people were asking me to do, you know, three years ago, they're like, oh, why don't you do a newsletter? I was like, well, you know, we write every day on, on voicebot.ai. But what I figured out at some point that the news wasn't like a great place just to do like thought mm -hmm. pieces or just to, you know, engage in, in topics that were just for discussion or these little vignettes or knowledge bombs that you know, are useful to people in the industry. So that was the genesis of Voice Insider. We've now had that for two years, over 100 issues. We've had 100 issues as of this week. By the time people listen to this, it'll probably be 101 because we, we do that every week as well. And that's been really fun as well because it's just like a palette every week just to mm -hmm. say, hey, you know, what's important this week? 
uh, what uh, what's something that maybe you don't know that would be really useful to know and just to share a little bit of industry insight as well. So if we think about, we've got the podcast, as you mentioned, we've got voice by that AI for the news, we've got the research, and then we've got the voice insider, which is just another, another way to engage. And I don't really think about it as content. I think about it as uh, discussion, education, you know, what we're in the business of is helping people make better decisions. And a lot of that's just through awareness of what the options are, but then it's also taking the time, whether it's in Voice Insider or in the research to step back and to say, okay, we have all these data points. What do those mean in the, in the broad scheme of things? You know, what, how might that influence the way you think, not just about what you're gonna do this week, but over the next quarter or year or two years? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when I first came around to the voice space, you know, it was all sort of predicated on this idea that who knows, maybe one day hearing aids will be a great home for voice assistance. And lo and behold, I met you. I met, you know, just about every voice guest that I've had on the podcast through one of these different in-person shows. And you really are, I think a lot of people will attribute, you know, a lot of the way that they keep track of what's going on through a lot of the research that you do. A lot of those charts pop up everywhere. You see them all the time. Um, but I, I really do like the podcast and I like the voice insider so much because I do like, I like the news, but I like hearing your own thoughts on them because as somebody that is doing this so, um, you know, uh, on a consistent basis, I think you formed this knowledge tree that has so many different branches that, you know, they all interrelate in some way, shape or form. And I love hearing, um, you know, a conversation that you have say with like Jeff Adams. And then, you know, I, uh, three months later, I hear you reference that episode. And um, I just think that's such a good way to, you know, when you can follow somebody's thought process in terms of all of the knowledge that they've been acquiring, and then almost in real time, being able to connect the dots um, with them is just really, really valuable. And the first, you know, you know, I guess way to kick things off here is um, you at I think the first time I saw you speak, you talked about, you know, phase one, and I believe you said phase one of voice assistance is uh, more or less around proliferation, which um, I think you can attest has been something that's been an ongoing thing, you know, through all of the different devices. And then, and, and correct me if I'm wrong about phase one, but then phase two was habituation and specialization, um, which I believe you said that in like 2019. So I'm curious, like, do you consider where we're at with voice technology today to sort of be in this um, in the same phase or are we entering into a new phase and what categorizes that new phase? Okay, that's interesting. I've been thinking about this a little bit uh, because I think it was actually the beginning of Voice Insider that I talked about entering phase two now I've had a couple different discussions about this, uh, also at conferences as well. And so if, I probably characterize it slightly different ways depending on the context. Uh, but I, but as we're talking now, let me tell you how I think about it, right? I think about the first phase was really the introduction. It was essentially a narrow casting type of concept. It was a voice assistant within a context and that context was defined by the device it was available on and the things that people were doing on those devices. And so we had the we had the narrow context of Siri on smartphone, we had the narrow context of Alexa on a smart speaker, and then where those things went. And when I first started talking about phase two, which I still think is, is right, it was really about expanding the distribution across surfaces. So this idea that voice assistant would have universal access and distribution is that term because we have a lot of technologies that come along that seem very promising, but then they don't get distribution and not enough people either have access to it or seek it out or then use it when they do have access to it. And so they just die in the vine. Cause, and, and, and that's really one of the things I was most interested in very early on. Would there be enough entry points for people to use voice assistants so that they could actually bring them in? And so that second phase that I was really talking about two years ago is I was saying, hey, we're seeing the rise of smart displays. We're seeing other types of smart home devices. We're gonna see expansion in the car. Uh, we're gonna see more use on the phone and other places, right? Uh, and I think that's largely been correct uh, that's happened. Now, when I think about this idea of habituation 
and the deeper adoption, that's really where we are. We're sort of, I would say we're in phase one or phase 0.5 of that. And what it's largely been is it's uh, habits that people had in other areas of their life uh, and they're transferred it to a voice assistant. So the number one example is music. I know Nick talks about that, Nick Hunt uh, from Y4 talks about that a lot. And he, he really ties a lot of the things that are going on to music. And it's a useful rubric. I don't like buy into that 100%, but it's, it's, there's absolutely a significant, uh, significant uh, correlation there with music because we see that on smart speakers. Uh, but I think more broadly, what we're gonna see is this, just the benefit of this throughout all media. So if you look at other surfaces, like I've talked in the past about having the Xfinity, that's Comcast, it's a cable provider for your overseas listeners, uh, voice remote, and that's been around for a number of years. It's amazing. I had Janine Heck, uh, who led, mm -hmm. led that project on my podcast a few weeks ago, and it is such a superior way to interact with your cable television that it's hard to even conceive of going back if you, you know, if you ever had to. I, I don't look at the guide anymore. It's just not right. a thing. So, uh, and so, and I think about that from a music standpoint, if you've ever used Amazon Music Unlimited or YouTube Music on maybe a Google device, uh, you'll also see that it, it it's a similar experience for music. So no more tapping, typing. It's not just like Spotify where you wanted playlists because it set it and forget it, mm -hmm. right? You don't really have to be locked into that. That's fine too. You can call up a playlist. You can switch playlists by voice, right? Or you can just ask for that thing you just want right now that's not on a playlist. And so a lot of people underestimated, I think, how complex media search is, especially since you've got a lot of common words, you've got uncommon words in it. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, recurring titles, uh, and you've, you've got a lot of complexity like artist, yeah. band, genre, song, all these other things. And then when you go to visual media, it's, it's even more complex, although there's not as much of it. So, uh, so I think that uh, it's sort of like I've gotten a little bit off on a tangent here, but I think uh, if we think about the habituation, people have shifted uh, music, at least on smart speakers, over to voice control. And, and actually, I just uh, did some analysis on this. Consumers that are using uh, uh, music on, uh, on smart speakers using Amazon are much more likely to be using Amazon Alexa app on mobile mm -hmm. uh, because they're using that to like get to their music or they're using the voice assistant Alexa through their Amazon uh, Music Unlimited app. And so when you start using it one place, you use it the other because it just becomes a habit. Yeah. And I can even say that a member of my family does that. I mean, who never had streaming music before and then all of a sudden had it on the smart speaker and said, oh, I want this on, on my phone too. So it's just, a, and the interaction on the phone then became what was on the smart speaker before on that. So I'd say that that's one of them. Another, uh, another use case that people did is that, uh, at least some of those quick questions uh, that you'd always go to your phone or sit down and, and type it in. And now that people are asking much more frequently. So uh, timers and alarms, you know, people had those, they had them on their microwave, they had them on their phone, whatever. So people are using those more by vo voice, either through the phone or through a smart speaker or something like that. So I'd say that this phase really has been the shifting of existing use cases, predominantly to voice. And we haven't expanded that much into new use cases. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really well said. And, um, you know, it's like, I know we've talked before about Clayton Christensen and, and jobs to be done. And um, I feel like you're right, where it's sort of at a phase right now where it's, you know, we, we're seeing, um, and I think this is a delineation between where Alexa does well and where Google does well in particular, um, in terms of where they're sort of picking off use cases. Um, you know, with Google, if you're in the Google ecosystem, I think you might start being, uh, you might be inclined to start defaulting to using Google Assistant to just use like as the navigation interface for your phone itself. Um, yes. A lot of search as well. I love what you said about TV. I think the TV is such an interesting use case that I don't think is talked about enough because to your point, it is the training wheel effect where 
um, if, if, if for nothing else, if that becomes the default way that you search for, you know, everything that's on the Amazon fire stick that you use, you're still building that habit. That's the habituation piece. Um, but the one that I really want to kind of explore because we haven't even gotten into specialization is the media piece. I know you were going down a little bit of a tangent, but media to me, like, I think I've heard you mention this before too, that you think this is at least one of the killer use cases in the short term, um, for voice assistants, like that makes so much sense in my mind because it is something that even in the primitive state, you know, more or less that voice is in, um, in a lot of ways, it's actually superior in uh, comparison to the the legacy way in which you retrieve, um, you know, pit, bits and pieces of content. Like for example, the conversation that you had about Beeb, um, that's really really interesting to me because if we are thinking about media being cataloged in individual repositories, but it being narrow and deep, and and it being um, just way more accessible. Uh, in these, you know, sort of, I guess, custom voice assistants tied to the media. Like I think Spotify is another really good example of this, of where this is going is um, if you, if you're able to retrieve information in a much more, uh, you know, not only a quick way, but I think just like a more robust way where you can query through a little bit more of a conversational interface um, it seems like, you know, in, in conjunction with the fact that media already sort of seems to be the use case that people are gravitating toward with smart speakers in general, starting with audio, uh, or I'm sorry, starting with music, but I think we could see that the next progression being podcasts, and then you just sort of start to climb the ambient ladder that's being built as it goes, um, that is a, is a thread that I really want to pull on with you and just get your thoughts on this, because uh, I know you've had some conversations with folks, um, you know, like at the BBC and what's your current thought process around this whole notion of media as um, a, a big entry point for people to, to build that habit. Yeah, I think we can look at media as the example of of where we're going to have profound change. Not to say that that tells you immediately other areas of our daily lives, uh, but it is if, if we find something that looks and acts like media in, in some way, you can say, oh, there's probably a really good application here. Now, a lot of people know that we founded VoiceBot in 2016. So that's about four years ago, uh, just over four years ago at, the, at this recording date. Uh, but I've been working in this space for uh, at least two, three and a half years before that or something like that. So 2013. And uh, we were working with media and it was voice interactive advertising actually on mobile. And so it was really deep in that media space before I ever, you know, got into, you know, thinking about the industry as a whole, because we were doing voice interactivity, people, you know, an ad comes up on um, when you're listening to a streaming music service and you can just say, uh, you know, play video, uh, open map, or give me directions to the store, uh, download now, send me the coupon, whatever it's going to be. Really simple, uh, simple interactive voice capabilities, but new to the world, right? So not something you could do before. And, uh, and, and, and in that case, it was just, you know, more than 10x more efficient than doing it in a visual mode on the screen because we found in our, our research somewhere between 79, 83% of the people were listening without the screen, you know, in, in, in visible. So if I think about, you know, I step back and I say, okay, well, that was sort of one thing from an advertising standpoint within a specific context. But when we get to media, I, I really, what I really like that you pointed out was that there's actually these new things that you can do. So there's new features. So to a certain extent, I love the Xfinity voice remote because I can just say the station I want to go to, or I can say the program I want to listen to, and it already pulls it up. Now I could do that on the remote before I could type it in. Um, I could go to the guide. If I remember the number, I could punch it in, but it's not as efficient. There's, it's, so it's, it's, it's much more efficient. It's that 10X. How, yeah, it, it was definitely, it's, it's definitely 10X better in that way. And it's 10X better because there are things you couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. So for example, I could say, show me Clint Eastwood movies, right? And it would just show me all of the ones. And mm -hmm. it would not only show me all of the Clint Eastwood movies, but it would show me which ones are free, mm -hmm. which ones are, um, are you can pay for, 
when you could watch it, which ones have ads, you know, if it's, if it's a third party streaming service you have. So that's really intriguing, right? That you can mm -hmm. do that. And it'll also recommend other things for you, right? So if you say you want to watch golf or something like that, mm -hmm. it might say, hey, here's golf and here's other things that are related to golf that, uh, that you might want to see. There's not that much related to golf. So maybe that's not a great example, but there's other golf, I guess. Uh, so if you want to watch uh, rugby, maybe to show you Australian rules football too, maybe mm -hmm. a better, better example. Uh, so, so that's one of the things I really like about that. But let's look at just music, right? So the music experience, I don't think a lot of people have woken up to this, is a lot better with a voice assistant. Yes. And it's because they've never tried it because they have these existing habits that they would need to displace or at least ignore for a little while while they try it. But this idea that you could just say, play somebody, play something by like anytime, play this song, play this song with these lyrics, mm -hmm. play the song that goes, right, 99 problems in the Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, whatever. Right. And so it, it is just like it knows it like immediately and starts playing it. Right. And these are things that if you could do through a through a visual interface were very difficult. But in the most cases, you could not do. And you know, it, we always had this benefit of like the systems like hearing what we like and you know, sort of not always, but for the last 15 years, you know, creating these new streams of music based on what you like. Um, but now you can just like pick something and that's your starting point. It just goes, and you can change it at any time. And so I think that's, I think that's really pretty, pretty amazing. We see that in the visual, we see that in the audio from a media standpoint, a lot of it has to do with search, right? So you're looking at this complex catalog and then this idea that if you're going to search, you might actually know a little bit more than traditional search. A lot of traditional search, what you're doing is you're saying, Hey, I don't know about something. Tell me what the options are. There's a different type of search, which is I, I already know what I like or I know what I want, but I don't know how to get to it very quickly. And when I think about media, that's actually one of the one of the really big benefits of voice and this conversational UI. And now there's other ones that are really amazing, which we have, you know, we can talk about later, but that's about this idea that you can have this iterative multi-turn conversation. Yeah. So if it doesn't understand, like in this case in music, it might say, do you want the live version or do you want the, re the studio version? Maybe that's a point of clarification. That's not usually what it's going to ask you to do, but it could in order to you know, better serve your, uh, serve your need. But a lot of other things you can, it can actually do clarifications where it doesn't have enough information. And I just look at this and I just say, listen, you know, if, if we look at conversational interfaces and we look at media, I can already tell you that is a killer app for voice mm -hmm. because it is so much better. It, I believe there are many others out there. We're not seeing them necessarily yet. Yeah. Well, I think that it's important, though, to constantly reiterate, though, that we're in this habituation stage and, um, you know, okay, so first came the proliferation and then came the question of like, well, what do we do with these devices? All of these smart speakers that we have, that we've been outfitting our homes with, our offices with, wherever. And what's interesting to me is that when you start to, and, and you factor in the multimodal component of this. So it's like, yeah, maybe my primary mechanism for where I'm building my habit is through my TV. Um, that, you know, as like your research has indicated, like a lot of people, their habituation point starts with their phone and then they actually um, might carry that over to their smart speaker or vice versa. But I think that um, this point around the 10X you know, increase is really important to point out because I think there are a lot of really exciting use cases that this, you know, built around media in particular down the line. Like I still go back to the conversation that you had with Amir Hirsch at Audio Burst as being one of the more mind blowing episodes and one of the times where I really kind of started to see the bigger picture here. Um, but that's a little bit forward, you know, that's a little bit down the line. Uh, and we can get into that, you know, throughout the episode. But I think that even in today's state, um, it's like these things that are, they seem sort of small in isolation, I think are really important in aggregation because they help to, you know, just again, it's not just building the habit, but it's getting people comfortable with this idea of I can, if I, if I go into my phone, you know, 30 to 40 times a day to adjust my music or adjust my podcasts and I start to shift that over to my voice, um, 
it's just like you've suddenly moved a significant chunk of your computing to an entirely different paradigm. And that's what can be built upon, I think, into the future. And I just think that's worth pointing out because if we're in phases of these, you know, technologies, it's not probably going to be something where just like overnight, suddenly everybody starts using voice assistants for everything. It's going to be a gradual year long process or multi year process of just gradually moving more and more things over there. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And if we, if we talk about this idea of distribution to habituation, I would say, let's revise and extend my remarks there. There's an adoption phase in between there. And so maybe it's distribution, I can use it. Adoption, I do use it. Habituation, I use it regularly. I think what a lot of people forget is between distribution and adoption is this concept of applications. You know, so there needs to be some innovation there that people say either this is a much better way of doing what I'm doing today, or it's something that's new that I haven't done before. So, you know, there's innovation, there's awareness, there's this development of applications. For voice assistance as a market to be successful, for the technology to take hold and for people to value it, they really only need one thing to stick, right? Because then that becomes the anchor, people become used to using voice assistance, and then it becomes an option to use it in all these other places, and, it's, and then it becomes a lot easier for everybody else. So if I'm already using a voice assistant, for music and then I add it to games, people are gonna be like, oh, okay, let me use it for my game as well, right? Because they've, they're already aware that it's a thing and they've built that cognitive trust that, oh, voice assistant actually enhances the experience. Uh, so, so I think everyone building an application now because we have music in particular, you know, I put that at a higher level than like timers and alarms, mm -hmm. uh, which are also very popular. Or uh, navigation is another one that's really popular, probably the, uh, the most used uh, of the of the voice assistant applications on smartphones today, uh, you know, aside from phone and some of the other you know, phone mm -hmm. utilities, you know, calls and texts. Uh, so we, people have seen those things. Now that's like, oh, okay, that much that much easier. So if I'm coming up with this new idea that you can't do today on a smartphone, for example, yes. uh, with through a touch interface, and it just happens to leverage a voice assistant as the UI as well as call it the do engine, if we go back to the Siri terminology, it does something for us, then I'm already there, right? I, then I don't have to teach people to say, oh, there's this voice assistant. And if you have a voice assistant, you can do this. You can just say, hey, here's a new application. You can do this. Oh, how do I access it? Use it with your voice assistant. Okay, I know what that is. You mean the same thing I use in the, for music or on my smart speaker? Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. Um, what about the specialty piece? I mean, do you think, so if this is a habituation and specialization, how, you know, would you categorize this um, as what you sort of just described there? Or how, how would you describe that aspect of this phase? Well, hmm. to expand beyond some of these general purpose yeah. solutions, it is specialization. And, and we're already seeing this, right? So. There's a number of banking apps out now. I can think of three off the top of my head uh, that have voice assistants that can hold like a conversational interaction, uh, maybe single turn, potentially multi turn, but you know not that you know that that complex. But if you look at U.S. Bank, I think he, uh, Richard Weeks told me they had over 300 features available within their mobile app. You can't expose 300 features through a visual navigation, right? Now, you don't necessarily know how to teach people like how that, that, there's, that they should know that this is there, but at least if they start getting used to asking questions, they can ask for something that maybe your development team didn't anticipate that they might want to do. And then as long as your NLU does the matching properly, you can say, oh, yes, I have a, I have a feature for that, and then go ahead and start to execute the, execute the request. So you know, when we think about that specialization, Within within the mobile app, you know, a lot of people are telling me, or, or I don't think this is less common than it used to be. They say, "Oh, it's going to be all uh, Siri or all Google Assistant," mm -hmm. or fewer people said all Amazon, but they said that you know that was a possibility. It's going to be this one assistant to rule them all. And I've always said, "No, I, I think them, they're going to be more like applications. We use multiple applications 
And it's okay that they have different UIs. They're, they're specialists. They do something really well because these general purpose solutions ultimately can't specialize enough exactly. to fulfill every feature need I, I might have like in banking. Or if they did, they would do sort of the generic, maybe it's a Pareto 80% set. Uh, and then there's like this 20%, which maybe Capital One really differentiates on. And they, they can't just wait for Apple or Google to release that feature because then, then it just commoditizes what they do, which might be what the general purpose assistants <laughs> want to do. Right. Uh, but, but they know more about their business. Uh, you know, if you look at Suki and Seikara and the healthcare space, which I think you're familiar with, and they know more about what doctors are saying and doing with patients or, um, or orbit of health and, and those types of mm -hmm. things. It, if you think about these broad and shallow solutions that the general purpose assistants are, it's really valuable. A lot of people are going to be using those, but they can only, they can only dig a few wells. We see this in every application category. Every time someone comes out with a one-stop shop solution, someone else comes with a bolt-on, which is a specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's where we are. I think that's we're starting to see that a little bit for development. That's really where a lot of the action is. People thought they were going to do it as an Alexa skill or Google action. Some of them yeah. tried it, some of them and were dissatisfied. Some tried it and they're like, oh, okay. I, I don't think, I haven't seen anybody who said, hey, this is just like the most amazing thing. You know, a lot of people said, hey, this is good. Um, some people said not good, uh, but I've yet to come across someone who's built their own and said, oh, this was a waste of time. They're generally yeah. thinking, hey, this is really valuable. I think, um, you know, not to <laughs> pump your tires too much, but um, you were pretty prescient with, uh, you called your shot. You said that it was going to be habituation and specialization. Um, you've been, had a big emphasis uh, I would say over the last six months on the podcast, largely around this theme of custom assistance. Um, and to your point, you know, this idea that it's not, uh, I think it's become pretty apparent that we are entering into um, a world that is, a, there's a multitude of voice assistants. Um, and I think that's actually a really good thing, you know, going off of what you said about, you know, Eno and some of these different banking apps. I'm not sure if it would ever if it would ever really fly for me to ask Alexa about my banking information, you know, to go retrieve it um, from a, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that there are so many complications with just having one assistant. Um, so in addition to being able to have specialty assistants that have these deeper wells of very specific, um, you know, not only context, but also like one of the big learnings I've had in speaking with people like Jeff Adams and um, some of the different, you know, groups that Cobalt's worked with is that they have very, very specific lexicons of, of terms. And, right. Yes. You know, when we're talking about NLU engines um, that are, you know, like when I was interviewing Brett, or I'm sorry, uh, Bruce Reza with uh, Ag Voice, you know, right. he's got lexicon that's all built around, um, you know, the scientific term for different molds that grow on berries, you know, so it's like, and, and you can apply this to the world of banking, the world of um, hospitality, you know, you name it, all these specialty niches that all have sort of their own jargons, medical is another big one. Um, so I think it's, that's a really important piece to this too, is that everybody's sort of like, if you're building your own custom voice assistant, you have the ability to build your own NLU engine that's running on top of that with its own lexicon. And therefore you can create like these highly, highly accurate systems. So my question is across these custom voice assistant uh, podcast conversations that you have had, um, you know, in light of what you said, where we are maybe moving more toward a world that is, um, and I'll be curious to get your thoughts if you do still kind of consider there to be echelons of assistance. So the general purpose ones, like, do they truly sit on a level above and are they kind of like quote unquote master assistants? But um, first, before we get into that, um, with the custom assistance, what have been some of the things that you've seen that have been really interesting to you across some of these interviews that you've been focusing on lately? Okay. Yeah. So I think we've more than 15 episodes this year have been on that. And so if, if you think we do, we do somewhere between 50 and 60 episodes a year at this point, it's probably three quarters of our episodes have been, uh, or no, it shouldn't be three quarters. Um, 
more than a quarter of our episode. So yeah. 25% probably, um, or, uh, or 25, probably to 35, probably a third, I would say at this point, because we're, we still have a number of episodes left this year. In any event, uh, the reason I did that is because I thought we needed more attention to this topic. And the other reason I did it, and I didn't do it in previous years, was there are just more examples. So in the past, I, I couldn't have put together, like a year ago, I don't think I could have put together 10, or I think I did mm -hmm. 14 straight or something like that. I don't think I could have done that. I maybe maybe get seven or eight. Uh, or I would have, in order to get to that level, I would have gotten, I would have had to dip into things that were, weren't really that fully baked. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I, I try to bring people on something, sometimes with early research, but I try to, I try to make sure that they're out there and, and have something already working so that we can we can look at it and see if it's if it's real and not just an idea. But if I think about what's interesting, first of all, I'd say that uh, you know I, you read Voice Insider, so you, you might remember when I put out the the gown framework. Yes, uh, and that would have been more than a year and a half ago. I don't. It was I think it was early nineteen. Might have been even eighteen. Um, but you know, in that I was what I was trying to do is I was trying to basically open people's eyes to say, hey, you know, we talk a lot about Alexa and Google Assistant, but you know, Siri, it's not the only game in town. Mm -hmm. There's other things that are happening, um, and and so then in that gown framework, I've got this general purpose category, which is Alexa, Google Assistant, Siri, Samsung, Bixby, etc. We've got the O is the owned. So that's like Eno or Erica from Bank of America. Uh, we've got these white label, uh, which are all the tools that allow anyone to sort of add voice assistance uh, to their solution. Uh, that could be SoundHound, Aikido, Microsoft Hot Framework, all those things. And then, and then we have these niche, uh, which are specific to a task. So it's almost like Uber is specific to like getting a car. You know, they've just mm -hmm. a voice system specific to your back office as a small business or recording transcripts from your from your uh, from your meetings. So you know, I sort of laid that out and said, "Hey, this is this is this is a much bigger world than a lot of people are thinking about it." Because this is, I it it might be more obvious to people now, but back then it was just like everyone only wanted to talk to me about. Right, the, the big tech companies and their voice assistants. I say, yeah, I, I don't think that's where we're going to end up. I think that's that's a that's a place. And it's been very important because it's focused innovation. It legitimated the market and made it a lot easier for all these things to come underneath it. And so this year, we've had a great time talking to a lot of different folks. I just had a great conversation with Monica Lamb, Dr. Monica Lamb from Stanford. And they have Almond, which yeah. is the open source voice assistant. Uh, I you know I had. Uh, Alan Nickel from Rasa, another open source voice assistant. Uh, a couple months back, he's the CTO over there at Rasa. Uh, really fascinating. A lot more, a lot further along than something like Almond, uh, and really widely used. You know, it's. It, I, I think people are going to be surprised about Rasa because it's so widely used that people don't even recognize like right. how big that company, how how much momentum they have. Uh, but that, I think those things are very interesting from a tooling perspective. The, the the healthcare ones are sh certainly interesting. We just met Sekara. We just talked about Sufi and Sekara. Those sort of build on a much longer heritage of of voice interactivity in healthcare that really was pioneered by Nuance. Uh, but you know we've had we've had Orbit on as as well. You know I think in that space I think that's that's worth worth pointing out. Uh, but I will say that I think the media ones in some ways are the most interesting to me uh, because they're the ones that are so obvious. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we just talked about Comcast or Xfinity voice uh, for TV search and, and, and control. Uh, we had BBC on with Andy Webb and Andy Webb you know, was one of my favorite conversations. Yeah. That one was and, really good. And it's not necessarily because of anything. Yeah. I don't know if there was anything, what he said or, but it's, what I liked about it was he was articulating a way forward into how you think about using a voice assistant. Yeah. And they've built an architecture that goes beyond just the single point solution deployment. So there's so that the B, their voice assistant, will create commonality no matter what platform you're on, whether you're accessing it through Alexa or through their own mobile app or through a smart TV or those types of things. So the B is really this this capability in the back end that if you're in a DPC property, you'll be interacting with 
the front end will be the Beeb, the voice assistant you know. But if, you, if you're using Google Assistant, it'll essentially be the same thing. You're just going to hear a different voice because the engine behind it is going to be the same. And so what I liked about that is it, they looked at voice as more of a strategic capability. And they said, hey, we could build this, this back end once, and then we can plug in all these different front ends. And... Uh, and for a media company like theirs, it has such a rich and uh, and deep catalog of product. It makes a ton of sense for them to do that. And so that that's you know you know and I and I contrast that with like someone like U.S. Bank that has like a lot of customer content. And in that case, it's not the same thing as they're just trying to surface amazing content from their back catalog. They're just trying to make a more efficient process for people to execute their transaction. And so in, in some ways, it's like, it doesn't have to be as robust. It just has to let you get the job done. It just happens to be getting the job done in, with banking is a different expected experience or desired experience by the customer than when you're trying to interact, find, discover, or engage with media. Yeah, the, um, the Andy Webb one and just Beeb in general, I think was like, that was one of the moments I think over the last few years that really stands out in my mind. Another was um, a lot of it's like the plumbing that I think is really interesting. So um, if you recall, like with NPR, they made it so that with any smart speaker, um, and it and it was a lot of like really clever coding. Um, you could just say like, uh, you know, hey, Alexa, um, play NPR. And for it to register your location and feed you your, you know, the affiliate NPR station, again, these are like small little details, but I, I think they're really meaningful because again, it goes back to the whole habituation and specialization piece where suddenly if I like to listen to NPR and I traditionally been listening to it through my, you know, my radio in my house or in my car. And then like now I'm accessing it through my voice. It's just one more thing. And the other thing with Beeb that I found really interesting is that like, it's such a, it's such a robust library of, of, um, of news and, and content that, um, you, it, it, it's so, uh, there's so much that it, lends itself really well to the idea of being able to query four things. So being able to just like, rather than just say like launch BBC, you can actually have like that turnstile conversation to get to what you're actually looking for. And again, it goes to the 10X thing where it's like the traditional way of navigating through all of that content that's constantly being replenished um, starts to become kind of daunting. And so again, like from my own perspective, I'm looking for where is the, where are those 10 X experiences right now to continue to build those habits? Because if you, if, if we, you know, just in the same way that we had the proliferation that enabled the habituation, I feel like the habituation enables, like you said, this idea of, okay, maybe a voice modality on any given game suddenly makes more sense. So it's like the chicken and the egg thing in my mind. And What's fascinating about the custom voice assistants to me is that um, we're seeing that like, you know, basically any company can uh, have some sort of existence, you know, as its own voice assistant. And one that I've been thinking a lot about is um, like, I want to see this open up to the masses and I don't know how this will happen. But, um, you know, we had an interesting Twitter exchange not long ago um, where I was basically advocating that I think that we need to have a Google-esque moment. You had some really interesting caveats to that. But, um, you know, more or less, I said that, you know, I look at companies like VoiceFlow and some of their predecessors, like a Voice XP, whatever, um, this idea of, you, okay, so if we have these engines that are building, you know, the, um, the websites or the voice sites, um, for any given company, any restaurant, any service-based company, any company like mine, Oak Tree Products, um, you know, what does, what, what, how do we manifest into this new economy of the web? And uh, what I'm curious about is what you said, uh, this automated interactive presence, that was something that you had said, like you thought that was going to be where things are going to start to get interesting in this regard. And I just want to flesh this out a little bit, because again, if we have 
the tools. And right now they're just limited to Alexa skills and Google um, actions. But I do kind of think that th this is going to become a broader ecosystem. I don't know how all this is going to work, but I think it's really important when you have um, no code type tools that any company can deploy or agencies can get a hold of and they can make it part of their suite. Um, but I think that this idea of empowering people with the ability to have a semblance of their online existence in a voice modality is really, really intriguing to me. And I feel like the first movers here are with the big companies that have the capacity to build a, their own voice assistant. You know, even if they're not super robust, they're still their own entity. How do you see this expanding into more of like the general population, if you will, like anybody having their own voice presence? might be really loaded I okay you, you you said a lot there <laughs> so all right so let's see let's first thing i want to talk about is adoption okay okay so uh i like history i like to look at the way things have had in the past i, I don't believe that every historical precedent is useful or is going to be replicated in exactly the same way but it's a good frame of reference if i think about the early days of the web and I think about the early days of mobile, it was not corporate content that got people there. So the corporate content, the brand content tended to be the long tail. So that was a, the, like very few people used it, but when they did use it, they liked it, right? So it was good to be there. And so I think if, if I recall that Twitter exchange, I think that's, there were a couple of things around the analogy that I didn't think was quite right. Uh, but I think that the, the thing that I was really, thinking about more was, does it matter if Nike has a voice presence or not? Mm -hmm. uh, does it matter if Goodyear does uh, or, uh, you know, pick any company, Chase, or maybe something more fun, um, Under Armour, uh, the CrossFit Games, uh, Spartan Races, you know, whatever you want to say, right? Uh, music artists. Uh, what, what I think we would see as we say, yes, we want that because uh, breadth of content is, you know, winds up being a really big benefit. But we, we do potentially get into a situation that we had back when we were building the first internet net markets and uh, in the 1990s. And that was that when you when you have a two-sided market uh, that is high, with high fragmentation on both sides, it's like hard to get critical mass because nobody really needs nobody really needs to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the same problem you have with someone trying to create, let's say, like a rival to Facebook, right? Because they can they can provide it, they can they can put the utility out there, but then like how do you what's what's the rationale for people to join, right? And I think that that's the first thing that I start with. Say okay, so if you're looking at adoption around like a new technology like this, what are the reasons that everybody's going to go there first? And then while they're there, can they then benefit from all these different things? Because let's say like, this is very common, like if you've got a number of features of an application, uh, everyone uses three of those features. Uh, so let's say you've got a hundred people, all hundred people use three features. Mm -hmm. And then of that, you know, you've got the next, the fourth most popular feature, like 50 people use, and the fifth most popular people, you know, 27 people use. And then you wind up getting out to like the 10th feature and like three people use it, mm -hmm. right? And, but there's just a lot of 10, you know, there's a, that three then 10 through 150, like three people use it, right? And so, uh, so if we just step back and we talk about sort of this adoption and, and we think about where things are going, it's like, you want to see people, you want to see a lot of people coming for a couple things, uh, come for the music, stay for everything else. Right. Uh, or come for smart home, right. And stay for everything else. Right. Maybe that's, maybe that's the thing. So there's multiple ways that people get it. So that's the first thing I would just say is like, so I'm a little bit, and, and I think, uh, someone was talking about this idea online too, like, uh, you know, we just need all these little things. And, you know, I say, yeah, and, 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 cause I think, I guess I had said something like a Pokemon moment, Pokemon go moment or something like that. Or maybe I was, I was probably repeating something David Beisel had said in the past, but, uh, I, something like that is useful. Yeah. Right. 
And because it just focuses everyone's attention. And then once they're there, they, they just start dabbling in other things. And, you know, the interesting thing is, and we can take this back to what we were talking about earlier. So augmented reality, which with Pokemon Go, the game that a lot of people would be familiar with, was the first introduction for, for many people to augmented reality. Right. And was highly popular, uh, normalized it uh, for a lot of people. At least they have a frame of reference now, which is great. The problem with AR is it doesn't have distribution. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So you can't really have, you can have adoption of, you know, there it started with specialization, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have adoption. And so that game had distribution, right? Because it was on smartphones, but AR as a concept doesn't have distribution. So AR, you know, to me is a feature of other things as opposed to its own thing. There's, there's no concept of like a general purpose to AR, at least that I can think of, you know, there, there is, there's, there's like capabilities like location, right? Uh, I was just talking to uh, Dennis Crowley of Foursquare about this. So he's going to be on my uh, nice. podcast just coming up shortly. I wanted to ask and, him. This is good. Time. Yeah, okay. It's, we can talk about that. But, uh, but I'd say that we, we need some of these things that capture people's imagination. Mm -hmm. And then we, then we have this other, this, this evolution. So I like, it's, okay. So that was one thing you talked about adoption. There were a couple other questions baked into there. Um, but I will just say just on, on specialization, you know, there's this whole idea of tribes when you think about adoption. There's one thing, this general purpose thing that like it, it goes, it cuts across tribes. Tribes are the, are the affiliations we have in life. Uh, but there's this other thing that happens is that you have lots of different tribes who then adopt something because it serves a specific need. It might serve a different need for them. But then eventually they've all adopted it, right? And, and and if you think about voice interactivity as a whole, um, that's uh, that's certainly this this idea of interactive engagement, voice interactive engagement, or conversational engagement, uh, is you know ultimately I think we had we had this moment with Alexa, and then with Google Assistant, we had a we had a previous moment with Siri, but it, it wound up being very confined. We had this sort of new moment with Alexa and Google Assistant. Uh, we're we're seeing this movement around media and music, right? So all those things are consolidating, and that's created the space for someone to create this, uh, to create their own custom domain and specialist specialty assistant, mm -hmm. uh, and for them to not have that friction of people saying, "What is this?" Right? I don't understand this. It's you know, it's mind blowing, right? I don't. I'm afraid of this. And they say, "No, okay, this is just like using Alexa or Siri. I can use it here," and what what I wrote about, and this was about a year and a half too, and I like to bring this one up because I was off by two orders of magnitude. I said, Alexa and Google Assistant will be known as launching a thousand assistants. Mm -hmm. And it might be three orders of magnitude, but I think it's at least hundreds of thousands of assistants, probably millions of assistants. Uh, because what we're thinking about, and this just goes back to, and I'll tie this all up now. Uh, for those of you <laughs> looking for the how this thread ties back to this original <laughs> question, uh, we say, okay, I've got all these different people who are using voice assistants and, uh, and I've got all these different people now adopting because of specialization. Uh, you know, where did that start? Well, they looked at Amazon and they said, well, you know, Apple can do this. Google can do this because they already have this installed base. Oh, wait, what did Amazon just do? That's crazy. They just created this new product category and this engagement that they're getting with, with, their, with their customers is something that I would like, right? Now it might have seemed out of reach. They've got ten thousand people you know, working for them and all these different things, but it turns out that there's a lot of people building tool sets, and so it's not just like VoiceFlow to work on uh, to Alexa or Google, but it's these other people, whether it's SoundHound or uh, Acuto or Spokestack or any of these folks who are building these tools to allow anybody to deploy their own assistant in like a reasonable time frame with a reasonable level of complexity. And so what they did is this idea of, they saw voice interactivity was really valuable. They're like, oh, I should be able to have voice or conversational interactivity with my customers, or I should be able to use that to extend the feature set on my service offering. Uh, how can I do that? I would really like to do that. And then it just, it, it just happened to be that there were people who were coming up to try to make that better. I don't know if I tied that all together yet, but no, I think hopefully you did. I think no, because I, I asked a, 
poorly, very long worded question, but my question was the gist of it is it's all building off of what you've been describing here, which is like this phase that we're in. And um, as the, you know, uh, the whole process of using your voice to compute becomes more habituated through different entry points, I think that sort of incentivizes um, the broader ecosystem. And then the question becomes, what is the broader ecosystem? Is it confined to Alexa skills or Google Actions? Or are those just, call them super, super mini ecosystems? Um, and you have, but you have something that's bigger than that. And, and that's why I think MarsBot is really interesting to me. And I'm sure you're going to have a great conversation with Dennis because, again, it goes back to how does the restaurant that's on a busy street, you know, what does their parallel to a website look like in this world? And what I think is interesting about MarsBot is you kind of are looking at a way that uh, in one capacity, you can have that manifestation. Um, so maybe it's just, I'm going to have the specials of the day that are read to you by the chef, or it's more or less user generated content about that particular restaurant. But again, in this world where not only are you, is there distribution in terms of the voice assistance and using your voice, but you have all the different modalities that go along with it, whether it be you're driving in your car that has the, you know, it's MarsBots activated through the Apple CarPlay, or it's through my AirPods, whatever it might be. I guess what I was getting at initially was how do you see the small guys, like the, the SMBs of the world, um, entering into this space in a meaningful way where it does sort of become its own internet or something that resembles the internet in terms of everybody has um, a website kind of moment. The first thing I'd say is everybody doesn't need to have a website, like yeah. a, a, a voice site. You made, uh, that was a great, because you, you said in the caveat, you said the whole, um, you know, the shift from analog to digital. So it was necessary to create a website back then. Now, a lot of this information already exists on the web. That's right. So now, now there's a couple of different modalities that we could use for sort of everyday companies, particularly restaurants. So restaurants are a really interesting example. Uh, when's the last time you went onto a wet restaurant website and you're like, this is a really good website? Very, very rarely. I don't think I ever have. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure I have, but I don't think I ever have. But I do uh, it to look at the menu. Correct. That, that's what you do. So so let's just start with the fact that websites have terrible, or excuse me, restaurants have terrible websites. Mm -hmm. I think that's generally true. Uh, and it can be hard to get to the menu. The menu usually comes up as a PDF. You can't... Uh, uh, if they have it set up so you can actually order or, you know, or search or those types of things, it's usually like too hard to see everything. It's like you, you always like the trade-offs is, are just <laughs> a series of terrible outcomes. Okay. So what does that mean? I, I'd say that in this, in this era, a lot of people are thinking about ordering takeout. Okay. So there's two different ways that that winds up happening. If it's a favorite restaurant, they could have a website or a mobile app that you go to and they have a voice assistant inside like Domino's has for Dom. And it can, you know, do multi-turn interactions with you, tell you what's what the specials are, what's available, can fill in the blanks if you don't tell them all the information, like what size pizza do you want, not just what toppings you want, those types of things. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward to do inside your app. And I think anybody with an app that's trying to drive people to that, whether it's Starbucks or Domino's or, or uh, the deli on the corner, uh, they should figure out a way to deploy some sort of voice assistant capability because it just, it, it'll help them, their sales will go up. I think a lot of things would be good for them. Now there's this other angle, which is having the general purpose assistance, which probably makes more sense for most, uh, uh, most of these organizations, whether it's Google Assistant or Siri, let's say those are gonna be the most popular, allow them to deep link into your solution. Now, right now they're somewhat limited. So, we could use Siri, like actually you can use Siri for banking. Um, it's one of the domains they support. So you, so if you think about like RBC, but you can't do a lot, right? You can find out things like your balance. Uh, I don't even think you can transfer money with it, right? Uh, if they had their own assistant, they could do all these different things, but you can go from outside into RBC and do that. I'm really interested in Google Duplex for web uh, because anybody who has a website, then yeah. it would enable you to potentially use Google Assistant 
to go pull information back in this conversational way, and then also fill in a form, which is essentially what Duplex for Web would do. So that might be something, I think we're a couple of years away from that being anything that restaurants could use, but it would seem like a really good option. We've got this one option, if you're Domino's and people are using it a lot, okay, your path is really straightforward. And then we have these other people that we want them to, you know, you want them to be able to use their general purpose assistant to get in there. And I think that's a little further off, but I do believe that we'll get there. Some you know, basic features to be able to be done. The one thing I, I think is just important to point out about restaurants is uh, two things. One is if you're gonna order, ordering from restaurants is actually really complex uh, because there's additions, substitutions, subtractions, uh, and that's hard to manage. There's also this idea of, uh, of comprehensiveness. So you have to be able to go through all these different steps. The other thing, the other reason people want to interact with a restaurant is what you'd want to do is they just want to find out information. Like, so what's on the menu? And that's not a great experience listening. So, right. you know, so then, so then we're thinking sort of, it may be voice request and visual response unless you have like a single shot, like specific requests would say, you know, do they have this dish? Oso buco, is that on the menu tonight? Yeah, so that's that's something where I could say, yes, it is, uh, it, it's available and that would that would be really, but I think just this general browsing idea, like audio is not good for browsing. Mm -hmm. um, there's this idea of an audio browser, but it hasn't really taken off. Um, I'd say the closest to that is audio burst, which you mentioned earlier, um, but, that's not really just browsing because it gives you sort of complete content as well. It's just this idea that you can go deeper. That's the browsing concept of it. Uh, so that's it. And I just, uh, well, I should let you jump in, but I will just say on Marsbot, I think it's really interesting because we haven't really talked about hearables. Yeah. <laughs> um, for the so far, we've talked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's a application that really can exist without hearables. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole Marsbot thing, what's fascinating, like in my mind is similar to smart speakers, you had the proliferation and then now it's like, now what? And this is what I've been waiting for is that when you have a hundred million AirPods that are out in circulation and, and it's just climbing, I mean, now we're going to be entering into any, I think 2021, we might actually see a hundred million sold in 2021 alone. Um, so the question is like, well, what gets built on top of this? And I think that we're uh, Foursquare is a really interesting company that's like kind of like come back from um, irrelevance to like because when I was in college in like the 2008 to 2012, it was actually a really cool hip app like checking into bars and I'm the mayor here and all that and then it kind of fizzled out. But now it actually is relevant again because we're all like geolocation. I think is the it's sort of the parallel that I see as being um, the the camera was to the to the smartphone, like it unlocked tons of new use cases that that only that modality could do. I think um, in a way, GPS having audio fed based on your proximity opens a lot of really interesting doors, especially if they're going to open the door to UGC. Um, again, I just think about like the generation below me as just running wild with it. Um, so I have a, a lot of different thoughts on this, but I think that the common theme that I keep coming back to is uh, with all these things is the proliferations now happened. Like since the time that I met you, um, we've only seen it be like just straight up into the right in both smart speakers, smart displays, hearables, um, all of the modalities that the voice assistant can reside. And now all the questions and the thoughts that I have in my head are all pertaining to this idea of like, what do we do with this? Like what the, the, the footprint exists to build on top of. And I kind of feel like the Alexa, like I kind of think that like my own feelings are that Alexa was a little bit of a head fake. I think that ultimately Jeff Bezos just wanted to get us to buy more things through uh, Amazon and through Prime. And I think Alexa is a, especially given that you can tie it to Amazon pay, it seems like that's probably the number one incentive that Amazon has around Alexa. Google Assistant is like the next phase of the interface that you use. I mean, that's the delineation I see between Android and um, iOS that's shaping up is that 
the why why own uh, an Android phone over a smart or an iPhone seems to be more and more Google Assistant. So those two things, and there are ways that I think like this whole there are ecosystems that can be built around it. I think you're really spot on about duplex and how that might be the solution, you know, for, you know, the conversation element for all the different businesses out there. But what are your thoughts on like just this sentiment that, um, I mean, we've already talked through a lot of this, but I guess as we kind of wrap up, like we're entering into another, I feel like we're, this phase is maturing now. Um, people are becoming more comfortable with using their voice for different things. And I think that as we're seeing with the custom assistance, some companies now are, are sort of chartering their own path. And they're saying that like, we're going to just have this independent conversational experience that you can have um, through your AirPods or through your smart speaker, whatever. Um, But I, I wonder, you know, like if it is, um, Alexa and Google launched, you know, they're the Helen of Troy and they launched a hundred thousand voice assistants or a million voice assistants. Um, does it just become a world where that's the evolution of the app economy is just that you assume that just about every mobile app, it has a layer of conversational, um, assistant to it, you know, cause I think you started off the conversation by saying that they're more like applications. So what's your thoughts in terms of like, the next three years, if you will, I know part of it, we're probably still in this habituation and specialization phase, but how do you kind of like see this maturing um, now that we've had uh, what's transpired this last year or, or so? Well, I think it's interesting. A lot of people like to look at calendar decades. <laughs> and if you were to look at calendar decades, you would say the decade between 2010 and 2020 was the mobile decade. Yeah. Uh, but actually, mobile was a revolution before then, right? And so you might say that it was the smartphone decade, because uh, you know, really, in in many ways, two thousand two thousand ten was the the mobile decade, right? Mm. Uh, because you know, it just happened to conclude with an explosion of smartphones. Uh, but if we look at the the iconic smartphone that was introduced, being the first iPhone. Uh, if you if you put it into a decade, if you're willing to use that metric, you you have 2007 to 2017. And let me see, when did the first hearables start to come out? 13, 14, somewhere 14 around 14 was when Braggy launched the Kickstarter campaign. And that's, according to Nikon, that's when the hearables era began, was 2014. But AirPods came out in Christmas of 16 or 17. So they've really only been around in mass for about four to five years. Right. Okay. So what I'm thinking is, you know, we said the Amazon Echo came out in 14, sort of limited release, really 15. And then we had uh, Google Home in 16. Uh, so we're talking about the same period. And it would, what I think people aren't talking about is we're in the middle of the audio decade. Yeah. Right. And so this idea of like mobile screens and all these things, but you know, you also look at that's when uh, I think it was maybe 12 or 13 when Spotify first hit you know, 20 million subscribers or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, you know, streaming music had been around for a decade, uh, but it had been largely confined to desktop and was just starting to get you know, become a mobile and all day type of thing. And so if you look at the last five years or so, whether you want to say five or three or whatever, with the rise of streaming music, with the rise of podcasts, which has come along at the same time. Uh, so the, the content part of it, uh, and then the rise of the devices, hearables and smart speakers, right? Yep. We're in the midst of the audio decade. Yeah, for sure. So that, and, and I, it's probably not lost on people in your industry because they're like, of course, <laughs> but it, it, maybe they'd right. say it's been the last, the last, it's been the audio quarter century as far as they're <laughs> concerned. I don't know. But I would just say that like, if you just look at broad consumer trends, particularly around technology, we're in the middle of that. Yeah. And so I expect that to continue. Uh, and I don't think we're anywhere near where we're going to be. I, if you look at something like Marsbot, I don't know if they'll be successful, but they actually have all the ingredients to make this work if it's something consumers like. Mm-hmm. It's something you couldn't have done before. Uh, you had hearables, it really wouldn't have been practical. Uh, they've got a really interesting 
set of policies and UI uh, formats, uh, you know, user experience formats that they're trying to lay out uh, for that. And it's going to go beyond just like, like the thing that you walk by and telling you something about, it's going to suggest things like around the corner that you might not normally see and those types of things. Uh, so, uh, and, and if you think about it, like that's the type of solution that needs a hearable to be successful and needs that audio to be successful. But once you add the ability for the, for the user to interact, to have a conversation, to ask more, mm -hmm. like, cause they, they limit it to five second and five seconds of information. That's what you get. So, but if that inter if that intrigues you, right. What are the hours? When do they open? Do they have a reservation available for tomorrow at six? Right. Uh, you know, or, you know, what are the, what are the, what's the next closest restaurant like this and the same thing. Uh, you know, so there, there's all these other things we're all within the capability of someone like Foursquare to actually fulfill uh, then becomes really interesting. And this is one example where voice takes things to another level and actually not only creates a, a broader capability, but, uh, you know, enables them to, you know, add a, a service that makes it far more meaningful. Because I think over time, you might get kind of annoyed about this thing, which just tells you, tells you, tells you, then you have to pull out your phone to do what you want. But you just say, oh, you know, if it's just, just that quick thing, you say, oh, just tell me more about that. Right. And so that's where I would say that I'm expecting things to go over the next several years. Uh, cap voice is a capability. Conversational AI is a capability, this interactive capability that people want to be able to provide and consumers want to be able to have. Uh, because, I mean, static web pages kind of look kind of, they, they look a little quaint at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you look at it, you can only do what they've provided you a link to do. Right. Same right. thing in mobile apps. When there are other things that those providers have that they could provide, could give to you, those you know, companies, media, media organizations, whatever, but they don't have a way to expose that to you. With conversation, everything becomes immediately available because it flattens out uh, your UI significantly. So that's really where I think it's going to happen. I think if you look at that seminal moment, you know, Alexa really put this out there for us uh, in a way that um, Siri set the table. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and then I think, you know, Amazon started serving the meal, uh, in, in, in many ways. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, before we wrap up, I do want to ask you one other question. We haven't gotten into it at all. And I just haven't heard your thoughts on it lately is Siri. Um, you just mentioned Siri. So I want to just really quickly dive into this a little bit. What are your thoughts? Because I know that, um, you know, there's a lot of frustration among the d developer community and the design community about like, where's the third party ecosystem. Um, however, I do think that we can't dismiss Siri because of the fact that you have AirPods, you have the Apple watch, you have the iPhone. Um, so they have a lot of the pieces there. Um, a lot of what I've read, it's not as if I'm in like you know, tied into any like uh, insider circles or anything like that, but that John G. and Drea, like he is the real deal in that he's just, you know, in the process of kind of implementing his own take on Siri. Um, so I feel like maybe we're going to see something come, uh, you know, the WWDC 2021. This has been kind of an ongoing joke is like, everybody's been saying, oh, are we going to see something that comes out and nothing ever happens? So maybe I'm just like, optimistic to a fault, but what are your thoughts on Siri? Like, do you think that there's anything that's happening there that's interesting? Or do you just think that their Apple's just like inherently not that interested in Siri and, and the larger ambitions that maybe it could have with a voice assistant, you know, to the iOS ecosystem? So I think Apple can be serious, but have different ambitions. So if you look at what Amazon has done or Google has done, Alexa and Google Assistant are actually the service, right? That's the end point where Siri's never been the end game for Apple. They're really focused on that as a feature that helps them sell more devices, right? So that's how they launched it with the iPhone 4S. That's the way they've looked at it. And there's been other things that they thought were more valuable in the interim. Now, ultimately they may have decided that uh, it's, it's something that could long-term hurt them if they're not more competitive or that it does fit with their new services oriented strategy because it would seem to align really well with that. Uh, so I do believe that we will continue to see more from Apple along those lines, 
but I wouldn't expect to see the same types of things that were from Amazon or Google. So that's, that's really the first thing that I would say. Uh, the second thing is I do believe in 2021, we will see something. I, I told people well before WWDC in 2020 that they would not see anything this year. And uh, they didn't. Well, we saw some UI updates to, to Siri, but that was, that was about it. So it was more cosmetic. Uh, it takes a while to integrate some of these technologies. I think people underestimated how much work needed to be done to replatform Siri from the legacy architecture that was built in 2009. Um, it's been scaled up over the years and, and really wasn't uh, designed even initially to handle the type of load they put on it, but certainly not the breadth and depth of activity that you would have today with, uh, with voice assistants. So I believe they are, from what I conversations I've had, they are making significant updates to it. It'll look different and more capable going forward. It will still be different than what we're seeing from Amazon and Google, just because their ambitions are far more narrow, at least today. Uh, eventually that might change, but you know, they're, they tend to be incrementalist from what I can see. I will say, I just finished this report up. So people can go to research.voicebot.ai. They can check this out. One of the things I laid out is I said, hey, if you look at smartphone-based voice assistants, there's four things to keep in mind. So there's the hardware elements. And in this case, we have the smartphone and then we have all the peripherals and hearables or watch would, you know, would be in that category, glasses coming up. Uh, and then we have the services layer, uh, which would be the general purpose assistants. And then we have custom assistants. So if you think about those four quadrants being really the holistic view of voice on smartphones, Apple is a killer in three of those areas, right? They've got a heavily used voice assistant. They have the 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 alternative platform for voices for uh, for smartphones in the world and it's, you know, the most lucrative, but you know anywhere from fifteen to twenty five percent, depending what what you're looking at. Certainly half in the U.S. You know fifty percent market share, and then they have the most dominant peripherals, right? So watch and and AirPods really gives them a significant structural advantage. Now where they're lacking is they're lacking in this capability for integration into iOS apps. They do have some, so we talked about RBC earlier. So Siri Kit does have a few ways that you, know, you can order a taxi in Uber, you can check your bank account on RBC, those types of things. But they actually have the same gap that Google has. Uh, and Google now with Google Assistant App Actions you know, is really a step up from where Siri Kit domains are. And I think that's going to really expand uh, Android integration with Google Assistant. But if you look at Google, then you're saying, oh, well, they've got the great, you know, the OS leadership. They've got Google Assistant, which is excellent. Uh, they're okay in the peripherals, uh, sort of number two or number three in those those categories, at least Android compatible. Uh, and then they're sort of they're they're not yet there on on the application side. So. In some ways, I think you know Apple's been okay in that they, if they think of their core franchise as being mobile, they haven't really given that much up in the interim uh, because Google hasn't like run way out in front of them, at, you know, to date. Uh, so I do expect us to see a lot more voice in apps. But even with that, you know, as we going back to where we were talking earlier, Google Assistant and Siri going into apps is not going to be that full rich experience anytime soon. Uh, I think it's going to ultimately be custom assistants are being built. The one thing I will say that would really make things different is if you think about Google Assistant app, app actions, they allow you to deep link into the app really under uh, underestimated in terms of how valuable that is because then you can use Google Assistant to actually execute a task, not just open an app like you were talking about earlier. So that's a really nice thing. But once you're there, you can't do multi-turn conversations. You can't access other features after you get into it. Uh, there, there, you need to start using your custom assistant. The pull string acquisition may well be because uh, Apple wants to have you allow to have Siri, not just to be able to deep link like you would with a shortcut, for example, into like, into an app to execute a transaction, but also so that once you're there, you can keep doing these multi-turn capabilities and that there's some way then that they're segmenting off series so that you can customize it, maybe with a different voice, maybe with different uh, 
logic flow or workflow builders and those types of things so that you can actually have that custom assistant and, and create this end-to-end -end solution where when you're in Siri at the sort of native platform level and then you go into an app, it's like seamless and you can go deep as well as go broad. Yeah, no, really well said. Uh, I, I always kind of forget about the pull string acquisition and and I agree with you that could um, it could end up being a really big deal down the line, particularly like you said, um, in terms of accessing the apps and kind of siloing off Siri in certain portions of time. The other acquisition that happened right around that time was the Dark Sky one, and I do kind of wonder if that if these were kind of congruent, like they they were thinking like well, weather is a really big application and what better of an app than Dark Sky where you can get like a really awesome experience through Siri. So part of me often wonders if those two were maybe like um, John and G and Drea inspired and like maybe they'll manifest down the line. But regardless, I, I agree with you that um, it's a little too early to tell, but I think like you said, there's uh, from a structural standpoint, you know, with all of the infrastructure in place, it certainly seems like uh, all it would take is a really awesome update. And then suddenly Siri is really, really relevant to this whole space. And maybe what that means is that as a developer, we're back to developing for mobile apps, but just through more of a conversation element to them or something along those lines. Or maybe it's the custom assistant piece um, that Siri works in tandem with. And it's it's the next iteration of the app economy as it becomes sort of like the voice assistant economy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's likely going to be the, the way that it builds out. But keep in mind that that uh, Siri is specific to the iOS ecosystem. So right. if you're going to build for that, you're, you're only building for that ecosystem. If you want to build for Android, you're going to have to do it again. And, yeah. and then you're going to have inconsistency. And so this is one of the 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 hypotheses I have then is that there will be some people who will rush ahead and will do this and deploy within iOS apps. Let's say Siri does it. I'm sort of thinking 2022 will be like the really big step up. Like there'll be a lot of interest. There'll be some very interesting early things in 2021, but it'll be 2022 when they have the new NLU from voices integrated and all these other types of things. Uh, and I, so that might be too late because people may have already made some other decisions. But I think ultimately, if you look at like what Capital One has done, you use the same assistant engine in the back end across web, mobile, and chat. So, well, I guess they, they would differentiate between chat and SMS. So it's just like one thing. It's very similar to, you know, this idea of BBC having one engine behind everything. Yeah. And so, uh, and so I think that most of those organizations, once they realize how great this is in their iOS app, if they haven't already thought about it, they're gonna be like, oh, I need this everywhere. And then mm -hmm. it's like, oh, can Siri go everywhere? No, it can't. So that would be the really big thing is if Siri then could go everywhere across all these platforms. Yeah. And so, you know, this, the first thing is, could you actually make it robust within the apps to make it really easy for people? Okay, great. So you make Siri better. You didn't, you, and you make Siri better by just making all the apps that, you know, Siri's not that important. You know, Apple iPhone's not that important. It's the apps that are really, really mm -hmm. important. And you make all those better, and that would be really cool. But then if they, you know, spread it across surfaces, wow, then you're like, wow, that would be really big. I don't really expect that. I expect the former. But if they did the latter, that would be really, really significant. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Well, Brett, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. 50th episode. Really excellent. Uh, Congratulations. Hashing. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, you know, it's just really cool to have a conversation like this. It's like, uh, you know, we've just been, I've been kind of, you know, through osmosis learning so much about the voice technology space. And again, you know, why is this all uh, relevant to, to future year and to like all the stuff that I cover is I really do think that there's going to be a marriage between these technologies. I think the voice assistant economy will be really, really relevant to hearing aids, hearables, all the different things that we're wearing in our ears. And um, I think, you know, for the voice enthusiasts out there, I really always uh, try to get people to think about like designing and developing for that modality. I think that's what got me so excited about MarsBot was it's something that is so hearable centric that it's like, whoa, like this is now starting to get really interesting where these two worlds are really starting to intersect. So it's been a lot of fun chatting with you, catching up, just getting your thoughts on where things are in the voice tech space. 
Um, like he said, check out, you know, VoiceBot, Voice Insider, VoiceBot Podcast, VoiceBot <laughs> Research <laughs> at Brett Kinsella. There you, go. You, you know, I don't, you don't even have to say anything. I'll just list them all out for you. So Perfect. thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Brett, for joining me. Thanks for everybody who tuned in here to the end and we will chat with you next time. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Future Ear Radio. For more content like this, just head over to futureear.co where you can read all the articles that I've been writing these past few years on the worlds of voice technology and hearables and how the two are beginning to intersect. Thanks for tuning in and I'll chat with you next time.